Right, good evening. This is Sean um, from the Infantry Base Academy. Um, just watching as some um, more attendees, attendees are joining us. Um, could I just ask maybe a few of you just let me know that you can hear me okay? Use your question or your chat box. Just let me know that you're there. And just let me know that you can see the screen. You should see a webinar Infantry Base Academy screen in front of you. That's great. Nice of you to join us, Anthony and Jane. Thank you. And Leon. Nice to see you, Steve and Laura. Oh, great. The screen is fine from Lucy. Brilliant. I just give a, another 30 seconds or so just for, for people to join and then we'll start. Hello, Sue. Nice, lovely to see you here this evening. Thank you for joining us. And to you, Julian, Mark. Lovely to see you again, Daniel. I can see you present. Thank you. Right. I think now is a good time to start. So, good evening. Welcome to Infantry Base Academy webinar for this evening. Um, it's going to be on the tenant fee ban, which tonight we're actually going to focus on answering questions about the effects on infantry business of the fee ban. But also we're going to look to highlight positives and the possibilities, the change that um, the ban will bring to our industry. And to help me, I'm really, really pleased to welcome back Dominic from Pinstripe Inventories. Um, Dominic co-hosted our last webinar on the tenant fee ban um, because he has um, a wealth of experience as the ban has been in place in Scotland since 2012. Um, so he's well versed to answer questions and help us understand what the effects will be. So um, Dominic, can you hear me okay? Hi, Sean, yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Um, could I just ask the, the attendees just to uh, give me an indication they can hear Dominic okay before we go any further? Yeah, I've got a yuck from Sue. Perfect. Hardly face from, from Lucy. Yes, from Lucy. Yep, from Peter Brown. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you so very much indeed. So tonight's webinar, Tenant Fee Ban, Positives and Possibilities. Um, when Dominic and I were talking about um, doing another webinar, we thought that there's enough information around at the moment to understand what the ban is, but not necessarily enough to say, well, you know, how are we going to work with it? What can we do with it? And what can it potentially uh, bring to us as inventory providers? So that's why we thought we would um, look at that this evening. So this is me. My name is Sean. Um, I, I work with the Infantry Base Academy and I help uh, clerks and companies um, understand how to uh, complete inventories, run their businesses and just understand the industry um, in a wider context. And this is Dominic. Dominic, would you like to say hi? hi. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, as Sean's introduced, we run an inventory company in Scotland, so probably um, facing a lot of the same challenges and difficulties as everybody else but um, uh, again as Shan's mentioned for us the fee band has been uh, we've managed to use it as a bit of a positive so uh, hopefully there's some uh, useful takeaways from today that uh, everybody can can use in, in their own businesses. Lovely thank you Dominic. So for the format for tonight so a bit of housekeeping we expect it to last around about 45-50 minutes um, as always I'm very conscious this is everybody's evening it 
certainly down in Bournemouth, it's absolutely lovely out, so I don't want to keep you too long. Um, so um, the format for tonight is we've got a series of questions we've already been asked. I've been asking people to send me their questions and their queries and their thoughts in, which you've all kindly done, which is absolutely brilliant. So we'll be working our way through those, but also um, looking to see what else you've got um, to ask on the uh, chat box. If we don't get round to your question or your query or your comments, don't worry that we will make sure that that is all captured, it's all answered by myself and by Dominic, um, and then we'll send that out with the recording from tonight's webinar. So, you know, please do um, ask your questions, you know, tell us what you're thinking, what you would like to know so that we can uh, make this, uh, you know, a really good experience and really helpful um, to you. So, let's get started. So I thought it would be great to start with a bit of background um, in regards to the tenant fee ban. So as you see from the slide here, the bill was published 1st November 2017. Then we've had loads of legislative scrutinies and loads of different um, types of um, reports and committees, et cetera, et cetera. So it all culminated in the end on 2nd May 2018. The bill was introduced to Parliament. I got it well was sent on the 12th of February, and it comes into the force. So it comes into force on the 1st of June. Sounded a bit like um, um, Star Wars there. Um, so it's coming in. So there's no um, changes to that. Although I did see earlier on in the week, or I think it was last week, in the press about that one of the government ministers has, has intimated it might change, that they might rescind the tenant fee ban as we go forward. But I, personally, I don't think that will happen. Uh, the reason I say that is because Scotland's ban has been in since 2012. We've got our ban in, and now um, Wales is due to bring in their own ban later on this year. So I think it's highly unlikely we will take a backward step and rescind that. Things might change. They might change um, parts of the legislation. Um, they might try to change some of the content, but I can't actually see the ban itself being rescinded. But that's just my opinion as we stand at the moment. So that's a little bit of the background. So I want to get straight into the questions. And one of the first questions we've had is how will the ban affect inventory providers? So Dominic, how did the ban affect you in Scotland when it first came in? Yeah, when obviously I think similar to what's going on at the moment, there was definitely a lot of uh, speculation and a lot of concern in advance of the ban coming in. And uh, what we were hearing was whether it was going to result in changes like, you know, the big one for us, um, obviously, you know, at current, clients who currently outsource bringing it back in house and whether that would, you know, cause a, a problem for us and a, a loss of business. So there was, as I say, definitely a lot, a lot of concern in the run-up to it. Um, and then, you know, on the other side of it was, it was a bit of an anti-climax when it did arrive, as for most of our clients and, and from what we picked up from uh, from similar businesses, things carried on uh, business as usual the next day. So we didn't have a we, the dramatic effect that we thought was uh, that we thought was coming from all the sort of speculation uh, in the, from the outset. So um, yeah, it's uh, as a, a bit of an anticlimax, but that that's a good thing for our business, and uh, hopefully that is, is going to be the same outcome uh, when it comes in on the first of June. Do you, you say it was an anticlimax? Is that was be because people had got really quite. Um, uh, concerned about the ban, didn't understand it. What, what was the main reason for that? You know that it, it was a bit of an anticlimax for you. Well, I think it's just the, the same thing that we've been talking about recently. The concern that you know, if if agents were to look at this as a you know uh, another financial strain on their business, they might look at uh, moving the process in house. And uh, and for us with clients that would most of our clients, you know, outsource the whole portfolio of work. So it's uh, it would be a, even for a couple of them to take that back in house to try and uh, combat this kind of loss of uh, revenue generation from the tenant side. That would have caused a problem for us. So we were definitely worried, you know, going into the, the legislation coming into place. But obviously the outcome that we'll probably talk about further was uh you know was that there wasn't much change of felt certainly on the inventory side i know other products like tenant referencing and things that's been a different outcome but um certainly on the inventory side we we fared fared pretty well uh once it once it was in place 
And would you say that is um, a that positive that that you fared well was was experienced across the board? Do, I mean, do you do you talk to other inventory providers? In, you know, in, in Scotland as well. Do you know what they were saying? Well, we probably don't talk to other inventory providers as much as sort of I would speak to you or someone like that. There's always a bit of that kind of friendly competition. Um, <laughs> but there is a there's a couple of people in our network that we did have a conversation with just to say, look, what's your take on this and uh, how are you approaching it? Because obviously we do have a concern and sometimes a bit bigger than just the, you know, who, who you're competing against. We, you know, we employ, you know, a number of staff and you've got a responsibility and a duty of care for them. And you need to make sure that your business is, isn't going to, you know, be seriously affected by it. So there was a you know, steps that we took to try and, uh, you know, prepare. And some of them we've laid out sort of later in, in today's discussion. So I'm sure we'll come on to them as well. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So one of the questions we've been posed is from Peter from Sunrise Inventories. And, and Peter's asked, is, I'm seeing landlords pulling out the market as more and more costs are being levied on them and tenants holding fire, e.g. encouraged by large universities down here to sign um, nothing until after the 1st of June. I presume then to kind of like make sure that there's just no fees associated with that tenancy. Um, as he's saying, it's definitely short term business blipped, but how does that compare to what happened in Scotland? So did you find on the, on the I can't remember, what was the date um, in 2012 that it went over, the, the ban? came in force? Oh, I, I wouldn't even remember exactly when no, it was sorry, in I that year. There, no, sorry. no, no. Um, yeah, I wouldn't remember the exact date. But it, it, interesting, obviously, that um, Peter there is saying that he's obviously has been speaking with, um, you know, some of his sort of key accounts and that the university, um, who, you know, obviously be a, um, uh, a large management agent, will, you know, are, are sort of being a bit cautious about it. I wonder if Letting agents will be taking the same type of sort of diplomatic approach approach to it or for the agents whether it's more a case of business as usual we're just going to keep on you know marching towards that date um, and you would hope that the, you know the agents are, are making the correct uh, preparations and they're they're speaking to their landlord base and um, and making a decision uh, on on how they're going to handle it. So the university one is interesting, but it, I'd say it's maybe a case that they are just um, you know a bit more um, cautious about things and, and trying to do it in a, a bit more of a managed way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in Scotland leading up to the ban, it was yeah it was a air of uncertainty. But I don't remember it affecting specifically the grant of you know new tenancies or or that causing a delay. Um, yeah. Where you know people trying to do something either side of the band didn't seem to happen. Um, you know, you didn't see yeah, like a great, uh, like a, almost like a, a, a everything coming to an absolute grinding halt. You know, like a week or two beforehand, um, it, it it just carried on as per normal. Or did you see just a slight change? Um, I mean, the, we, there'd always been uh, the the legislation was previously different in Scotland, um, to England anyway. There was there had always been a ban on premiums, but it was a very it was a great you know a grey area. So the mm -hmm. the tenant fee ban was was providing you know undisputable clarity over that situation, so that um, you know there was no loopholes, there was no trying to find a different way around it. So yeah. um, it, all of our all of our clients anyway, we had had the discussions in advance, we knew what they were doing and, and I think all of them were, were doing the same thing which was uh, you know, approaching their landlords and uh, and letting them know that they now have these new costs to bear, um, uh, you know, uh, that had previously been passed uh, either, you know, a percentage or in, yeah. in, in whole to the tenants. Oh, that's, uh, that's good to know. I mean, certainly from my own current experience, I'm not seeing any specific um, changes or shifts. Um, we're still getting bookings going past straight into the summer period, which is normally the busiest times, certainly from the student market. I'm not seeing any um, changes, but I'm keeping an eye on things just to see if there's any definite change, i.e. we get a lot more or a lot less or how it just changes around about the first. But certainly, yeah, my experience is, is that it's not really making much of a difference at the moment. In fact, I would probably say that some agents are actually deciding, well, let's not wait to the first June. Let's just get it in there, get it sorted. And then we know where we are and everybody's, you know, um, working from the same uh, or sorry, singing from the same uh, hymn sheet. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, no, that, that, that's the type of preparation and that you want to see because then it just makes it smoother for everybody. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So hopefully, Peter, that, that helps um, a little bit and, and addresses that. So that nicely leads on to, as we approach the first June, what issues do you, i.e. the us as infantry providers, need to consider? From your point of view, what did you think about and what did you do in order to get yourself prepared and ready for it? Yeah, I think for Mars um, side, and I know we touched on this on the, the first webinar, but it's definitely the sort of main takeaway we had from the, the process when the BAM was introduced. It, it's, a, it's a good time to take stock of your current client base and um, you know, to find out what they plan to do and, and what they, they have in place or, or you know, what they're gonna, how they're going to communicate it with their, their landlords. So that's definitely the first port of call. Um, to find out if you're going to face any difficulties within your business. And as we said before, if you employ staff, then there's a responsibility and, you know, as a business owner, you need to know that you're not going to have a problem, uh, you know, with the key part of your business, which is the, the people that work with you. So, um, yeah, I think it's definitely a, about starting to look at it as a good opportunity and there's still time to open up discussion with clients and what we found was that inevitably leads to business growth because uh -huh. we, we find it hard a lot of the time to have reasons to sit down and have a discussion with clients that, that yeah, doesn't sure. end up in, yeah, you know, it doesn't end up in the client saying, oh, great, now that you've come in to speak to us, actually, we've got a whole list of things that, you know, generally stem <laughs> from a negative point. Um, so it was a good opportunity to actually sit down with them and you find out what they're going to do and then see, uh, you know, in some cases, how we could extend our service offer offering into those those agencies. So when I've looked back at the kind of fee ban and then before that, the tenancy deposit scheme, you know, generally speaking, each piece of legislation has actually resulted in our business growing and we haven't had a, you know, a, something come in yet that's um, really changed the landscape for a negative. Obviously, it's it's harder for agents, it's it's harder for landlords, but so far the regulation on the industry appears to actually help people in, you know, in, in inventory businesses or yeah. from what we've seen anyway. Well, that's really good to know, because I know certainly from some of the conversations that I've been having, you know, some people are worried. Um, there are agents who are looking at what they're going to do um, and not necessarily in favor of uh, providers, but equally I've had conversations um, with other clients where they said well, things aren't going to change. In fact, I'm glad you're doing it because it's another another bit of work I don't need to do because I'm giving it over to you and, you know, we know that you do a good job. And therefore, you know, so it's one less thing for me to worry about. So I think you're right. Going back to your, your client base and saying to them, OK, what's, you know, how can I help? How can I make it easier for you? Is there any issues or any queries that you want me to help you address? I think certainly... Um, from my point of view, I think going in with a potential solutions already made for them really does help with that conversation. Because like you said, most of the time, it's just it's just um, the day in, day out work conversations. What do you need? When do you need it by? You know, did the tenant turn up? Where's the keys? All those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's using it as a way to, you know, you've got, you have a good reason to go in and speak to them because you need to make sure you know what their position is going to be moving forward after the 1st of June. And, and that lets you go in there and uh, present anything else that you want to, you know, albeit another, you know, service offering or just to help build that relationship. But it's definitely starting with taking a look at your kind of list of key accounts and booking in those meetings and, and going in to speak to them and, and make sure that um, yeah that things are going to carry on and business you know will continue yeah I mean one question just popped up um, is um, were did you find agents were actually fully aware of the change were they ready and geared up to have that conversation with you or you know how, how, how were they approaching it from their point of view um, yeah, there was uh, the referencing was a big, certainly a big part, uh, you know, a big sort of stumbling block at the, that point. So a lot of them were, a lot of our clients were focused on the referencing side and how they were going to sort out, you know, that fee. Mm -hmm. um, and then the inventory sort of came after. But because we were, you know, they're sold on the, the, the service we're offering and it was so embedded into their agency that. I don't think any of them looked at it and went, well, this will be the thing that means we have to pull it back in-house. 
it was just a case of, well, we're going to have to communicate this to our landlords. And it's not like the landlord can then go, I'm going to go down the street to another agent. This is government legislation. Everybody's got to do it. So um, unless the landlord really wants to save money and wants someone to offer them a cheap in-house service, you know, agents really shouldn't have a problem with passing the cost on. It's, it's not great for the landlord, but they, it's, it's not the agent's fault. It's this legislation that everybody has to adhere to. No, I think that's a, re a really good point to make. The fact is, it is legislation. It's not someone who's just decides, oh, that's a good idea, or I, I want to do that. Um, it's something that's set in law. We've got to get on with it. And I think most most landlords, certainly the ones I've spoken to, seem to be aware of the change and also understand the change. Don't necessarily have to agree with it, but they, they know it, uh, why it's there. And I think from our point of view as inventory providers, if we can provide not just a service but a really good solution and all the, the benefits that go around that, then that means then there's no reason for them to go anywhere else. In fact, I'm actually seeing more landlords coming to us direct in some respects, um, which for, you know, for maybe landlords who deal with portfolios, you know, that are, are a small, may, maybe that's fine. I think bigger portfolios tend to go with agents because they need that expertise and understanding of legislation. Um, I, I did, uh, so I didn't do, but what, what some person that I know in the estate agency, letting agency um, side of things, um, they did a, a list of all the legislation currently that they have to adhere to and be aware of and manage, etc. And I think um, the last time they looked at it, it was up to five 534 different bits of legislation they had to be aware of. Oh yeah, I could imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not becoming easy for them. Um, no. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, yeah, it just a, 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 a tricky one for them to try and figure out how they are constantly adapting their management package to make sure that they're you know um, they're always up to speed. But the the other thing just on that, I remember, I, we we also when we had these conversations we were we had to recognize that we were changing the, the pricing structure really as well it was an opportunity that if an agent was then going back to their landlords to say you're going to have to bear these costs it was an opportunity for us to discuss pricing again with agents as well so it's just another thing to remember that um if you have an agent at the moment that is perhaps um uh, absorbing some of the costs or passing a percentage of it on to tenant, uh, you know, it it may be a shift where pricing becomes less of a crux for that agent, and there's an opportunity to to go in and, and say, well, look, actually, we are revising some pricing and things, and uh, it's a good time to do that because they may be less price sensitive as they look to pass it on to um, to the landlords. Well, that's actually a really good point because um, uh, one of the questions that just come in is from Sue is about what services you you um, added or offered that were extra or different after the fee ban, um, and she also asked whether you blended the inventory or check-in service and did you find offering something different um, at check-in landlords either wanted or didn't want to pay for that extra or saw that as a non-essential service but just kept the inventory so i think what you're saying is like um did the inventory but not the check-in and, and or, or did the inventory and not the check check out did you see any changes with that mainly for us it was we uh, we would be try if we had an agent who we pr only produced inventories for and they retained the checkout process or something we were trying to use it as a way to take on more of the you know more of the service offering so saying to them look you're about to go to your landlords and pass on this cost now is a good okay. opportunity to also look at outsourcing so it was um supplementary services if we didn't offer the full service to them also things like inspections um but check-ins is a difficult is a tricky one for us i don't know i we might be very different from everybody else we actively avoid trying to push that as a service purely from a, a an organizational management point of view check-ins are you know they restrict our the, the flexibility of our diary and staff so much that um we really just heavily push inventory checkout as our service now um and we we do try and almost avoid check-ins um as you know as an added service because it's they're so restrictive um so over the past couple of years we haven't pushed them as much as as we used to anyway okay but you didn't find that you you had to um um alter that service much more than what you were uh, literally providing anyway so that essentially didn't really change 
No, certainly no, not with the band. It wasn't, um, and there wasn't, you know, pressure from the agents either to to try and get us to. Um, I know we've spoken about that before, sort of incorporating, you know, more into it or it, to a certain part of the service. Um, but no, so the the offering stayed the same, but it was definitely just an opportunity that if they were going to be approaching landlords with, um, you know, more cost, albeit uh-huh. coming from a you know government driven. Then it was a good chance for us to try and uh, try and you know you know get more work out of them or take on another part of the, the service if we weren't you know offering inventory and checkout for example. Okay, and so did, did you find that that um, allowed you to, to actually change your fee structure? Did, did you were you able to add to that? Definitely. So um, it, um, for agents that had previously absorbed the cost and we're using this as a time when they were going to be um you know passing more cost on to the landlord we mm-hmm. were able to with probably three or four at least revise um revise the pricing upward um at that point because we've been pushed so heavily um you know years previously when agents had said okay look we'll use you let's see your pricing and our plan is we'll have to absorb the cost our management package pricing is already too high or yeah. Um, you know, they were passing a percentage to the tenant and things, so it was a, it was a good chance to, to do that as well. All right, okay, okay. And um, well, another question I've just got is about smoke detecting, because um, uh, as we know, the um, smoke detectors have to be tested on the day at the start of tenancy, and I always advocate in front of the tenant so that they can attest to the fact that the the um, the alarms are physically working. So who does that? Um, so if you don't provide the check-in service, is that all done by the agent themselves? Yeah, anything. So obviously, if if a agent isn't using us for the check, and if they're just using us for standalone inventory, then um, you know the responsibility for something like that will use, will lie with them. Um, and most of them will then conduct the check-in service. They'll you know they'll they'll run that that process in house. Right. Okay. Okay. Right, that's really interesting, very interesting indeed. Okay, so um, let's move on to um, the next question that we got. So I think in a way we kind of touched all this about getting your clients ready for the ban. Uh, obviously you've seen and you've spoken to them, you've uh, explained to them about the service, etc. Was there anything else that you did over and above what you expected to do? Were there some clients who really struggled with it or other clients that actually were completely on board and, and totally up for it, any changes or and I suppose also advice, you know, were you having to give your, your clients a lot more advice than you would do normally? Um, I, it's tricky to sort of yeah remember exactly how it was handled by all of them, but most of them were they they were prepared enough and they knew what they were doing. Um, we we had a couple of questions about some saying oh look there, there might be ways that we could um, you know charge the still charge a tenant if it was at the end of tenancy and things like this. So there was a bit of discussion over that, but we really said look what we're reading is you know these costs are either going to be absorbed by yourself or passed to the um passed to the landlord so um yeah there wasn't too much of a requirement for us to sort of help you know to sort of hold their hand through it and yeah. because they they were working you know on the um referencing side and things as well you know they used, most of them were pretty clued up on on what was going on and and, and very aware of obviously the the fact that the band was coming in and uh, they they need to make some changes Oh, that's useful to know because I, I know some, there's been a couple of agents that don't really seem to have a grasp of what's coming on, but in the main, most of them know what's happening on the first. But I'm still seeing questions in different forums that I'm I'm uh, part of that um, are still asking questions about you know how it all going to work, you know, is it coming in that kind of thing. But it's it's good to know that you know that we're we're pretty much on the same kind of level in regards to how much everybody knows and how much everybody is getting ready. For um, for the band, so that's good. Yeah, I think for the for it, it'll be whether it'll be interesting to see if agents are coming back to you know inventory providers and saying that they're getting pushback from landlords. I think that would you know that will be. I'd be surprised if 
if that does happen because um, there, there, there really isn't much else that, that can happen. But um, yeah, hopefully most of them are now or planning on speaking to their landlords and letting them know this is this is what's going to happen. And yeah. uh, and potentially uh, that part of the reason of sitting down is that they'll want to present the associated costs to the landlord so, so they understand. Um, uh, but I, I would definitely say if there is anybody who is getting pushed back or it has clients saying, oh, look, we're not sure, there's uncertainty, you know, to mention obviously to yourself or reach out to me, I would be interested just to know, um, you know, what their concerns are and why they think that they, they aren't going to be able to pass this cost on or why there would be a change to outsourcing to, you know, you know that inventory company. Because um, yeah. it really should, the ban really shouldn't be a reason why any agent takes it back in house. Um, if, as long as your service offering is, you know, um, is still up to scratch, it, it, it should continue that way. I totally agree, especially because it, you know by taking it in house, the amount of on costs that that agent um, would have to then bear in regards to staffing and everything to do with managing and looking after staff, plus all the other aspects, i.e., um, software provision, cars, all that kind of stuff. Um, I can't see how it would be beneficial to take them in house. But obviously, the key issue there is about the impartiality side of things. The fact is that we, as infantry providers, are impartial. We're all about the property whereas the agents have a much broader um, and uh, sorry, much broader issues in regards to looking after the landlord, looking after the tenant, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, for us, we're the best place per people to, to make sure that those inventories are the best that they can possibly be. And I think taking it in-house, it can be a very much a conflict of interest and it's very difficult then to not allow bias to creep in, whether, you know, that's you know, consciously or not consciously. I think yeah, it's a, if for any agent that's taking it back in, it, that's going to be a big step back in terms of the quality of their management package that they're offering. So it would be a strange move, but it would probably be an agent who's very price sensitive, and uh, ultimately they're probably not the the best agents to be working with. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, just had a quick question from Paul. Um, just asking about uh, additional fees. Um, whether they landlords, uh, from your point of view, have absorbed that cost, or whether they pass that on to tenants by increased rents. Sorry, Shane. I, I, you, I, I lost you just there. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, it was Paul, Paul's asking whether landlords absorb the uh, additional cost of all the uh, of paying for inventories and all the other bits that they now no longer can um, charge tenants for. Or, um, and did they just absorb that or did they actually increase rents to cover that cost? Again, there was a, a big discussion about uh, whether, the, whether this would just push rents higher and um, it, I, I think there's been conflicting reports whether it has or hasn't. It's uh, certainly in Edinburgh's a bit of a bubble of uh, for, for you know uh, the increase on property rents um, anyway. But it, so it, I think it's very hard to tell whether it was a direct influencer on uh, on rents going up. But um, I could I could understand why that would happen and, and what you know as a possible uh, way to sort of uh, try and uh, get something back. Yeah, I suppose I suppose the same as anything, same as Scotland, same will be with us, is that we, we'll have the data beforehand for the last year or so, and then we'll see how it changes in regards to rents, etc. Um, like I said, especially with Brexit and everything else, it's such a, a mixed bag of, of, of changes. It's so difficult to really nail it down. So it'll be interesting to see where we are, say, in the next 12 months or so. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm sure even in the last webinar, there there was some stats in there on on it. So it'll be interesting just to compare that in in a year's time and see um, see what's happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. So if we move on to uh, the next, oh, I think I've gone the wrong way. Let me go right there. So we've had another question. Are tenants allowed to instruct an inventory and pay for it of their own accord? Um, this is probably more for me because I've actually had a quick look at that. Um, the government has actually brought out um, a lot of guidance, both for landlords, for agents, for tenants, for la and um, yeah, and for uh, what was the other one? Um, for the yeah, tenants, landlords, agents. And also like the uh, social housing providers, etc. So all, all of those types of um, property providers. And basically, um, in the tenant 
uh, guidance document, you, if you click that, and we've actually put a, um, a slide on here a bit further down with the uh, link for that, and we'll also send that link out to you as well. Um, if you go to page 30 of the tenant guidance, it actually states that yes, um, tenants can instruct um, their own inventories and they can pay for them. Um, the main thing is, is that they're not compelled to pay for them. So there's no one saying to them, you have got to have an inventory, either the landlord saying, I'm not getting the inventory, you've got to give it and you've got to get it and you've got to pay for it. It's got to be by uh, under the, so via the um, tenants and under their own um, request, as it were. So yes, they can, um, but they've got to pay for it. But only if they want to. So um, from your point of view, Dominic, did you see any changes in regards to the type of um, requests you're getting for inventories? Were they still mainly the agents and landlords or did you get any more tenants in or did it not really change at all? Uh, no, it certainly stayed the same for us. Again, we've always tried to avoid um, working with uh, private landlords, you know, sort of with one or two properties, it's a lot harder. Um, managing that than managing an agent with a lot of properties. So um, mainly the bulk of it still came, you know, from from letting agents just book and work in. We I think we had had a couple of tenants, um, but it would be a very small amount that had um, had instructed one, you know, particularly I think if they would had concerns during the course of a tenancy with the agent and they want they felt they needed, you know, some uh, some further protection from from their side if it was an in-house product. Um, yeah. But but certainly not at any levels um, that you know would be noted. Um, so we we would probably still get more landlords trying to book in a um, book in work with us outside of uh, a letting agent that doesn't an, an in house service. So you know them coming to us and saying like I want an independent report, even though my agency um, you know it produces one, it's an in house one. So um, yeah, we certainly haven't seen an influx of tenants uh, instructing them. Okay, and you were, and one of the so that's interesting because one of the questions that I've just uh, come up with from Lucy is about the the whole issue of bias, and um, basically she's saying she wants to know how will I remain unbiased? The landlord is paying for the inventory and the checkout, as essentially be working for them, um, stroke the agent. Yeah, I, I saw that one come through. I think it's. Uh... Um, there's always this kind of uh, again, it's a grey area on um, how biased or unbiased we we can operate. I suppose um, mm -hmm. we 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 still have a mix of clients who are some are absorbing part of the service cost themselves and passing uh, you know part of it to the landlord, or they are in effect absorbing the entire cost because they package our fees up into you know a, a landlord. Um, you know, a tenancy setup fee. So the landlord isn't paying a you know specific inventory fee. They're not receiving a, a, an invoice from us. They just it's packaged up into the the agent service. So again, we're still working on that in in that instance for the you know being instructed by the letting agent. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, Lucy said, "There, you are in a sort of slightly tricky position that you are in effect being instructed by the um, uh, by the landlord if they're paying for both services, or um, if you're technically if you're billing the letting agent and they are passing the cost on in the form of a management charge, um, you are instructed by the agent. So I think it just continu It always just comes down to you know the integrity of the business owner and um, you know following the guidelines. So if, you know if it's a um, Arla or if it's AIIC and making sure you're doing things right. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a checks and balances, I suppose, in place in the form of the tenancy deposit schemes to make sure that um, the information we've put is uh, you know is accurate and uh, that we're, we're, we're doing the, you know remaining to be as unbiased as possible. Yeah, it is definitely a tricky one. I mean, certainly from my own personal point of view, the way I look at it is our report is on the property. And that way, then we are not having to think about anybody else because it's what we can see, what we can evidence at that point, what we can show, what we can show the arbitrator. And certainly from my point of view, I think the arbitrator should be the person or persons 
that you um, aim your report at to make sure then that everything is factual, everything, everything is evidence. If you get that right, for me, everybody else is then covered and, and um, protected. Um, but it is a difficult one, but I think you have to stand your ground. And certainly from my point of view, mine is, okay, well, if you want to put or say something within the report, that's fine, but it's gonna be a case of landlord advises or landlord says or tenant advises, tenant says. So it's their words, not ours, but our report is factual and it's based on what we can see and what we can evidence and certainly um, in regards to pictures or video depending on how you do your report so um, like you said it's a tricky one but I think yeah certainly... we're definitely Sorry. the same yeah we're the yeah, same but we uh, even with checkouts I don't know if this is similar for other um, other businesses but we we will actively discourage tenants from being present at a checkout of course they can attend there's no problem but um, it's the same way if a tenant is present but a landlord isn't well you are going to be pulled in the direction of the tenant or if the landlord yeah. is present so either both parties should really be there or nobody should be there and we should just be left to get on with producing a report that um, presents our findings and um, as you say you're aiming that at whoever's going to be adjudicating it um, you know in the worst case sort of scenario yeah absolutely I, I'm, I'm with you on that I mean I don't necessarily mind either parties being there but sometimes depending on on the how they are and how the tenancy's gone can be quite difficult I think if you're going to do the inventory solely and do the checkout solely that means then like you said you're not influenced it is exactly as it is in a way you could look at it an arbitrator when they when they look at um, a case they are literally in a room with all the information no telephones uh, no outside influence, no nothing. And then they look at that case and they get on with it and make their decision based on what they can physically see, what's been provided to them with no external um, interference effectively. So kind of like that's what we're doing, isn't it, when you think about it, when we're in on in the property on our own doing that and also at checkout. So it makes kind of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Fabulous. Right, so if we just move on, because I'm, I'm uh, acutely aware of the time. So the next question is a little bit of a long one. It's from Bruce from Valensoul Inventories. I hope I'm saying that right, Bruce. Um, so two agents that he's had a conversation with regards to company doing their inventories, et cetera, has said that they will continue to do their own inventories. And one of the agents I've seen his reports, sorry, one of the agents I've seen his reports, and they are very heavy on photos and lack written detail. I've had two conversations with him to try and get him to understand that he needs more written text, but to no avail. Any suggestions on how to move forward with both of these letting companies would be helpful. Um, that might be a question bit for, you know, to, to, to give back to Bruce when we um, give out the uh, questions at the end when we send out the recording but is there anything you could maybe suggest right here and now for him yeah i mean i think um it's a really good question it's definitely something that everybody um you want to have all the answers in your your toolkit once mm. you get the meeting you know we work hard to chase agents down and, and try and get the meeting and you want to be able to give them the the answer to to reassure them about everything so the, the fee the fees ban is a good opportunity if they're you know a bit reluctant it's a good opportunity to sit down with them again but um yeah i would say for us it's it, patience has been you know a big part of it there's clients we've got on now that we have slowly and you know respectfully chipped away at for five to ten years before they make the decision to outsource some mm -hmm. happen you know quite quickly if they're in a bit of a bind but some take a lot longer and um you know you just have to be patient but it, yeah for us it's always a, a been about the service offering it's most of the times when we get to the point that we're pitching the the client isn't or the potential client isn't as fussed about or isn't as looking into the detail of the report or what the, the balance is as Bruce is saying between you know written word and photos they they expect that the report need will be of you know um, you know a really good standard um, mm -hmm. and that it, it will stand up when it's disputed but it's it's all the other, you know, the other parts of the service that they're really that what they want to know. You know, how is this going to make life easier for them? You know, is it going to help reduce their void periods? You know, what sort of weekend coverage do we have? Turnaround times? Will we support them in the event of dispute? So, I think it's a longer term sort of approach, but you have to position yourself as the authority in that local area where you operate and and make people uh, aware that. 
um, you're an extension of their business. You are their dedicated inventory department. And if you can convey that to them, then eventually, it, you know, with a bit of patience, the business does just come on. So um, it's tricky. They might just be the type of agent that it's, you know, there's not every agent is for us. Um, you, you know, everybody's got a different set of requirements. But, um, yeah, it's perhaps, it's, it's just focusing on your service, I guess. Oh, absolutely. I think it just also goes back to what we were saying a bit earlier on as well is about having those conversations and asking them, what do you need? How can we do it? And offer them solutions and listening to what it is that they, they're having their issues with. Because sometimes I find you talk to um, agents and landlords and they'll say that they've got one issue here. But when you talk to them, their actual issue is somewhere else. And it's about, like you said, identifying that and then giving them a solution and that way then they're more likely to go with you and use your service because you're offering something that maybe they hadn't thought about because you're looking at it from an outside point of view and you can see where you could potentially make a difference well exactly you're exactly right and as um you know this this, this uh, sort of potential prospect that bruce is speaking to there's obviously something uh, you know something underlying why why is there this focus from them between you know this balance of the content written and you know photo or what is the underlying issue where are they coming up against problems or um you know it's trying to figure out you know have they had some disputes have they had some uh you know some have they lost out and that's why they have maybe a bit too much concern are they not factoring in the fact that you are in that you can present yourself as an independent service so that's going to make their dispute process so much easier or the back and forth of the tenants is perhaps the issue at the end of tenancy and, and again you're able to go in there and reassure them and say everything's going to be completely different once you've outsourced to us um, yeah. your tenants your tenants will look at your service offering in a completely different way we say it to agents all the time if we you know when when they outsource to us the phone doesn't start ringing with tenants who are furious about our checkout reports and what we've picked up on because they know we're in they see us as independent you know i know we've just talked on how independent but they see us <laughs> yeah. as independent and um and everything is presented as, as clear as possible so yeah there's maybe something else going on with the agent it's probably just trying to find out what their pain point is and then you know once you figure that out um uh yeah you're, you'll be on to a winner Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I certainly do, and funny, I actually had this conversation yeah, yesterday, um, someone asked me, um, do you always say to um, the uh, tenant when you're doing checkout that you're, you're not part of an agency? And I say, yep, absolutely. I always make sure that they're fully aware I'm independent, my clerks are independent, we're there to do that role and to evidence as what we see it. So, you know, so that way then it, they know it's it's factual. So I always make a point of that. And that seems to settle people down straight away because often we walk in and they'll think, oh, you're part of the agency. And you're, you're literally the, they're there ready, you know, on the tip of their toes to, 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 to obviously, you know, vent some anger about some certain things. So it's the first thing I always say to them, no, completely independent, not part of the agency. We're here to do this. This is our job. And, that, yeah. and I always find that calms things down. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, you you have to sort of box clever sometimes with tenants. And um, uh, yeah, when you're going in there, that's exactly, you, you want to reassure them immediately of what's going on because they think that you have direct access to their deposit or, you know, or the, that's what's going on here. And it's not, that's not the case. You're there to pre present the facts. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just about reassuring them uh, as soon as you walk through the door. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, right, so I'm conscious of the time, so let's move on to the uh, next question that we've got. Um, oh, sorry, went too far. Um, question is, I understand that there's some charges the agent can make, what, that, what are they and are they capped? Right, um, that's a bigger question. Um, there's quite a lot of information um, on the web at the moment, certainly from the government, in regards to what the charges are and there's a list effectively there's a list of what can be charged and then anything else that's not on that list can't be charged simple as that um, so that is um, in the uh, landlord and agent guidance that the government have issued and effectively it's around the only things that uh, an agent etc can charge is things about around rent deposits um, change in tenancy um, any payments associated with early uh, termination of the tenancy, things like utilities, council tax, um, and late payment fees, or, or anything lost key-wise. But again, they're all capped. Anything over and above that 
is basically can't be charged. So um, the the agent has got a very definitive guide as to what they can and can't charge. And one of those things, obviously, from our point of view, is um, an inventory. They can't charge their tenant that inventory. But so that cost will always go back now down to the landlord or be part of their fee. So that leads me on to where can I find more information about the tenant fee ban? So let's press this right. So as you can see here, you've got the government have, have done loads of publications. You've got a statutory guidance for enforcement for authorities, um, guidance for landlords and agents, and guidance for tenants. Um, I'm just going to quickly scroll back there. Now, statutory guidance for, enfor for enforcement authorities. Some uh, clerks that I've spoken to wouldn't necessarily say that that's anything to do with them. But what I would advocate is that it's very important to understand and know what the industry in a wider context is thinking and having to adhere to. So it's not just about what we can and can't do in regards to inventory providers. We should also be looking at what our clients can and can't do and also what enforcement could be used against them if they don't do it right. That way that goes back to what Dominic was just saying a moment ago is that um, it's making sure then you're offering a solution and offering a service to the client more than maybe what they think they need because you understand and, and appreciate the, the industry as a whole and understand the pressures that, that are, are being levied against landlords and agents and understanding what can you do about that and you can only know that if you actually then um, understand the different government legislation that applies to them so as much as it's useful to look at guidance for us as infantry providers looking at it from a tenant point of view from a landlord point of view and also from the agency point of view is really important um, is that is that something that you do yourself um, Dominic? We um, it, it, we try and sort of stay as up-to-date as possible um, you know with uh, yeah, with as much information, and certainly there was there's been some real uh, useful uh, documents released. I think a lot of them you were sh you were sharing recently, and we'll normally try and you know take take those and find you know the most useful components of them, and then package them into something. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether that's going out as mail shots and things to clients, and and try and use them as you know another way just to help and continue to sort of present ourselves as um, the authority, and and that we're 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 really staying up to speed with everything. Oh, absolutely. I, th I think I certainly find it's really useful because quite often we get questions from an agent asking us about certain parts of either this legislation or fitness for human habitation or, you know, some of the, the, the new laws, etc. and legislation that's come in. And, I, and um, it, it's great that one that they can ask us, but also I can actually answer them rather than think, oh, I've got to go her way and have a look at that. Um, and I find it really, really beneficial because then I can talk to them. Um, I can push them on questions and I could advise them, and which means they're more likely to come back to me. And um, and I certainly do find that with my own clients. So I definitely advocate that. It, it really does help, especially going back to what Bruce was saying earlier on about, you know, how does he get you know the agents to work with him? Well, part and parcel of that is learning and understanding what, what it is that is causing all the problems and how you can, um, um, you know, provide a solution for that. Yeah, definitely. The larger the 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 agent, the larger the, the portfolio size, um, the more they expect. If you, if you're hoping to win that work and work with them, they expect mm. you to have a business that um, mirrors theirs in you know in terms of structure and setup. And a big part of that is your knowledge on you know what's going on in in the in the industry and how clued up you are to um, to the changes. If you know if if you want to sort of work with the, the big agents then they want to they want to make sure that you you are you're the best um in that area so it's definitely worth uh yeah ensuring that you're um, up to speed although i'm never quite as up to speed on all of that as you are i, I don't think <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like to I, I, can, I, can, I can admit i can admit that every time i speak to you, you you've definitely read whatever it is before i have <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I do like to read a lot. It's, it, it's, it's definitely my pastime, I think. But I find it interesting. But I, I also find I use it as well, which is you know the main thing. Um, it's not just because I haven't got anything better to do in the evenings. That's for sure. Um, so that leads me on quite nicely to. Oh, sorry, I keep doing this. Um, to the next question I've got is about um, whether a landlord or an agent can ask to pay a checkout fee at end of tenancy. Now, currently, um, as of the first, everything. 
everybody thinks that everything stops, but it actually doesn't. Um, if you look at the guidance for tenants, at the any tenancy that's enforced before the 1st of June actually still um, will incur fees. So checkout fees, for example, because the fact is it, it, that that tenancy was enforced before the 1st of June. Anything that's then signed after the 1st of June, no, but beforehand and certainly up until 31st of May 2020, yes. So you need to factor that in when you're talking to your agents, make sure that they're aware, because quite often I find that some agents don't read these things and don't necessarily understand it and just think, oh, that's it I can't charge anymore and that's going to be the end of it but that's not the case and certainly um, when you're advising your um, agents your clients your landlords it's useful to let them know that you know that, that, that there's still that provision there so I thought that would be a, a useful bit of information going along the lines of what we were just talking about yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah especially if, if agents uh, as you say aren't fully aware and they're going to make some changes immediately when actually they if they do a bit more preparation uh, it might be smoother for them totally right so so i'm bearing in mind the time um so i'd like to start thinking about what we've just been talking about for the last um 45 50 minutes though so from a positive point of view what positives from your point of view dominic has the tenant fee ban had for your business the main thing obviously is that we we didn't experience any downturn as a result of it and that was that was a concern going into it so um the the business has continued to grow we've taken on more clients um you know i don't know i don't if anyone were directly as a result of it but certainly around that time we, we continued to take on new agencies um and uh yeah as i say part of that it was we were able to go and sit down with clients but also with potential clients and use it as a an opportunity to to ask them what they were doing and to um you know for most of them who were then looking at starting to pass some of these costs on find out if that's an opportunity for us so um yeah the, I'd say I'd be surprised if it turns out to be anything uh, anything different, but uh, it, it should be a case that it doesn't you know affect too much on on your current client base and perhaps actually you know moves a few other people um, you know, to to begin looking at outsourcing if they don't. Just to touch on, uh, I saw as well um, Sue had asked the question about um, prices being hit as a result, agents asking for a price reduction. And mm -hmm. that wasn't that wasn't something that we had. Um, we didn't have a you know experience of them. In fact, as I said before, it was the opposite. With some, we were able to um, to review it because the price um, uh, issues were taken off the agent and and were now going to be something that was for the landlord to consider. So um, I am surprised that that's their immediate gut reaction is to start looking at contractors to um, to cut their prices. So yeah, it might be worth having a think, and um, uh, you know, certainly I could you know drop you an email or something just for some ideas on, or try and drill down a bit further into why they um, you know perhaps why they've taken that approach um, rather than just you know looking at what needs to happen, which is to to start passing some of these costs on. No, I think that'd be really helpful, and certainly we'll, we'll make sure that when we um, send out all the question answers and a, a recording of the webinar, that we'll, we'll um, put those details out so that we can actually do that. So that'd be really, really helpful. So yeah. that's positive. So from a possibilities point of view, um, from my point of view, I think there's loads of potential um, to increase your service to make you, like you said, um, Dominic, the go-to provider. That I don't like the word guru because it's so overused in the estate agency world but you know be the person who's in the know understands it and has got solutions for that um for that agent or for even for that landlord or or for that tenant so that's one of the possibilities i see coming out of the tenant fee ban yeah yeah definitely i think um uh yeah it's sort of similar to what we said in the positive it's, it's a, it, you can turn it into a good opportunity um being squeezed on price isn't going to be that is going to be a bad outcome but um hopefully sitting down with with clients and discussing it with them uh that's not not what they do in the end so um yeah very lovely. And also, I think they like said there's, there's an opportunity there to look at what services you've got now and what you can add to it, i.e. Um, 
a lot of people do EPCs, you've got Legion, Legionella risk assessments, but you've also got the wider letting industry. We're now going doing a lot more Airbnb, a lot more hospitality and corporate kind of work. So there, there's a load of possibilities there. So it's not just about the inventory. I think it's a much broader, much wider um, potential options for us as as professional clerks so I think it's about looking at what your client base needs wants and what they may be not necessarily um, understand that they want but they might need going forward and that, and I think that going back to what we were saying earlier on it's about talking to your client base finding out what they need what they want where the pain points are and trying to provide a solution for that definitely we're at a point at the moment where We've got, you know, by the time you employ someone and you cover some HR costs and a, a branded vehicle and insurance and, you know, your business insurance and office and phones and costs and whatever, by the time you finally get that person into a property, if you can add something else on top, um, you know, at the end of that service, that's really beneficial. And we've, you know, even things like um, floor plans, you know, being able to just add something small like that on, um, you know, even if it's a one off for a tenant, you know, an agent just looking for added marketing opportunities. Well, that really makes it a difference, um, you know, because you've gone through all the, um, the big expense of just getting that person into the property. Absolutely. So certainly I, I think what we're both agreeing with and, and I hope our attendees attendees have now understood and you, you, you're getting a feel for the fact that the tenant fee ban is going to is coming in we know that but it doesn't necessarily have to be negative there's a lot of opportunities a lot of possibilities we've got a, a real good um chance to really showcase what we do as a service show them how professional we are how much we um, know understand and can help them and help them develop their businesses so just by talking to them and letting them know that that you know we're so much more than just a an inventory provider that um, you know it, it, I think it can be quite an exciting time rather than something that's you know quite worrisome for some people um, obviously there's always going to be a uh, time where you know things might not go exactly how you would like them. But I think in the main, I think it's going to be a positive experience. And it's just a case of you just grasping that, getting on with it and, and finding out what you can um, help and um, support your client base with. Um, so from that point of view, Dominic, can I thank you so much for your all your help and and um, for uh, attending and, and co-hosting this webinar with me. Um, I hope that's been really helpful to all the attendees. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending um, a, your evening with us. If you do have any more questions, um, do feel free to place them in the chat box, or if not, um, you can email them to me. Um, and you can also find all of our details on here on the web under inventorybase.co.uk forward slash academy so again thank you for your your time your attention and um, i really look forward to um, seeing you all again speaking with all all of you again have a great evening thank you thank you